Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Taurus Data Science Podcast. Today's episode is going to be a little bit unusual. I'll be talking to Jeffrey Ding, who is an expert on Chinese AI at Stanford's Institute for Human-Centered AI. Now, Jeff puts out a very popular newsletter that I've personally been following for quite some time which is why I'm especially excited about this opportunity to pick his brain. Now, there are a lot of reasons to pay close attention to Chinese AI initiatives. Some are purely technological, so Chinese companies are producing increasingly high quality AI research, and they're likely to become even more important players in AI development over the next few years. You've got Huawei, for example, that recently put together their own version of OpenAI's massive GPT-3 language model. But China's AI ambitions are also important geopolitically. In order to build powerful AI systems, you need a lot of compute power. And in order to get that, you need a lot of computer chips, which are notoriously difficult to manufacture. And most of the world's computer chips are currently made in democratic Taiwan, which China claims as their own territory. You can see how quickly this kind of thing can lead to international tension. And now that China and the U.S. are trying to decouple their economies, onshoring semiconductor chip manufacturing is a high priority for both of them. But Jeff argues that the story of U.S.-China AI isn't just one of competition and decoupling, but also of cooperation. Focusing only on the controversial aspects of AI technology, like facial recognition and military applications, can cause us to ignore or downplay areas where real collaboration can still happen, like language translation, for example. I think Jeff is going to explain himself better than I can, so with that, let me step out of the way and let you enjoy the conversation. All right, Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining me for the podcast. Thanks, Jeremy. Good to be here. I'm really happy to have you here. I've actually been following your newsletter for a long time, and that was what led me to ask you to join the podcast. I think the China kind of the intersection of of Chinese almost geopolitics, technopolitics and AI specifically is a really interesting area and one that I didn't realize I knew so little about until I started following the, the newsletter somewhat religiously, as I now have. I'd be curious, though, what got you first interested in this area? Because it is very niche, it is very specific, uh, it's also very important, but what was your journey to not just like Stanford and you know the Future of Humanity Institute, but specifically as well to your interest in China AI? I have always been interested in US-China relations, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, that was sparked by high school policy debate, actually. So we would have year-long resolutions about like, should the US substantially increase its space development and or exploration? And it would always tie into like US-China competition or US-China relations as an angle. So actually, when I started my master's at Oxford, my topic was on uh, China's efforts to build up its soft power in Africa. So something, something completely different from what I'm researching now. But while I was at Oxford, I got hooked into a student group that was trying to apply AI for social good issues. So they would mash together people like myself who have no technical expertise in machine learning with machine learning PhDs. And we would try to work together on solving things like building a better diagnostic model for sleep apnea, uh, for example. And I just got really hooked on to the promise of this technology. Um, and it was really cool kind of seeing a project from collecting the data to actually having an output that could be useful for uh, like a medical school or for a team of researchers. And from there, uh, it just so happened that Future of Humanity Institute was starting up a GovAI, Governance of AI team, and they were looking for an intern who had Mandarin language skills or um, was interested in issues related to China. So got involved there and started working on a report about China's development of AI. And the, and the, translation, the translation angle really came about because I came across this 500 page book about China's national AI strategy. It was co-written by Tencent, researchers at Tencent, which is the firm behind WeChat, China's biggest social media app. And co-written by them, and the China Academy of Information and Communications Technology, uh, which is a government think tank in China, a pretty powerful uh, institution. So I realized no one had really looked into this document. There were so many articles and commentary about China's AI development, but no one was actually really looking in depth into what Chinese people themselves were thinking in terms of AI strategy. 
So I started translating chapters of these, of this book and other white papers and documents and just sharing it in a small email chain with some friends and peers uh, and colleagues at FHI. And there seemed to be a lot of good feedback about that. And from there, it expanded to uh, the newsletter. Yeah, it's amazing how quickly it made me think completely differently about the, the information landscape around AI, where you know you, you realize that, wow, like translation really is still, to this day, a real bottleneck in terms of getting different cultures, different peoples to understand how they're approaching things. Because there is like this overarching narrative about a competition between the US and China that does, that does exist legitimately, but aspects of it, as you explore quite, uh, quite deeply in the newsletter, are sort of let's say misdiagnosed, um, that might be an interesting place to go next, actually. So in your mind, what what is it that the prevailing narrative about Chinese-US competition over AI, what does that narrative get right broadly? And then maybe more interestingly, where do you see it being wrong? What are some of the things that you've learned either through the newsletter or just through life experience that have taught you that you know, things aren't, aren't quite as they seem on the surface? Yeah, it's, it's a really good uh, entry point for the discussion. And actually what, when you talk about translation, um, being like part of my work, but also translation is such a core part of, uh, the technical field of AI as well, like neural machine translation. Um, it's yeah. been one of the places where we've seen some of the value of these, uh, deep neural networks, deep reinforcement learning, uh, actually productionized and deployed on systems that everybody is using. Um, I think like Google Translate, the big jump in terms of proficiency, that's been really helpful for my own work. So when I think about what's important or what's newsworthy about AI, um, it seems like translation would be such a natural candidate, right? Especially um, with some of the major breakthroughs like Microsoft Research Asia, uh, their big breakthrough in terms of news translation, uh, reaching human parity was from Chinese to English translation. Um, so it's also intimately tied to US-China uh, relations. But actually, when you look at the prevailing narrative about US-China and AI, uh, there's almost nothing about what's happening in neural machine translation. Um, and it's dominated by facial recognition or autonomous weapons or th um, things of that nature. And it's not necessarily, and I think AI is a perfect way to, to, to kind of deconstruct that because AI is this general purpose technology in the sense that you can pick and choose which AI applications you focus on and say, that's what AI is about. Yeah. You know, that defines AI. Um, so I've been exploring in my newsletter and different translations about like what's happening in natural language processing, uh, a different way to think about just to even start about to start thinking about what's happening in US-China relations um, in the sense that if you're just looking at autonomous weapons or if you're just looking at facial recognition, maybe you see two, two countries that are inevitably gonna be decoupled and in conflict. Uh, if you're looking instead at what's happening in neural machine translation, um, maybe you see AI actually bringing the two countries closer together. Uh, so. That, that's kind of one way I've tried to like flip the narrative a little bit. You've done a lot of uh, as well writing and, and um, sort of research on the uh, semiconductor side, the hardware side of things, or at least I've seen that, uh, that theme come up over and over again in the newsletter. I thought that might be an, an interesting thing to talk about too, because you kind of, you alluded to this idea of an entanglement between China and the US. If you look at machine translation, you're right. It tells a story of like at least some kind of shared interest in technology that you really can't decouple these, these efforts. What do you see on the hardware side that kind of uh, maybe adds some color to that uh, that dimension of things? What are some of the interdependencies there? You know, hardware is different from something uh, like software, which oftentimes happens in global open source kind of alliances, uh, development of software, whereas hardware seems to be more concentrated in certain firms um, and more amenable to control. Where, where is actually, this might be helpful for listeners too who aren't familiar with like the hardware part of the story here, because like not everyone knows about like semiconductor industry stuff, but can you speak a little bit actually to the, the geography of it? Like what is that distribution like? Where, where are semiconductors being built and why is that relevant to this like US-China dynamic? One of the leading Chinese facial recognition firms since time. Um, if you look at like a PowerPoint slide deck of um, how they train their AI algorithms, um, the types of chips that they use to train 
large models that they then use to develop facial recognition algorithms. Uh, those chips uh, come from a company called NVIDIA, which is based in the US. Um, if you look at the types of chips that they use to run the AI algorithms at the end of the device, for example, that goes into the phone or that goes into the camera um, that actually runs the AI algorithm after it's been trained. Those chips come from Qualcomm, which is also a US-based company. Um, and it's largely true in the sense that US companies uh, dominate in terms of the design of these semiconductor chips that are used to both train and run algorithms. Um, now I emphasize design uh, because there's been a trend uh, in the semiconductor industry uh, in which the design of the chips is separated from the fabrication of the chips. And the fabrication of the chips is actually concentrated in countries like Taiwan with uh, a leading firm named TSMC. Um, so the, the fact that US companies um, do control large segments of the market in semiconductors. And we can complicate the picture even more if we go beyond design to like the equipment used to manufacture semiconductors or the packaging and the assembly. But if we just generally, there is this leverage point for the US to use um, sanctions on access to semiconductor, um, semiconductors um, to um, influence China or to uh, threaten um, or impose sanctions upon Chinese firms. Uh, and we've seen that with the entity list and um, which I believe that was March, 2018. Uh, I forget the exact date, but basically um, for involvement in human rights abuses in Xinjiang, various AI companies in China uh, were sanctioned by uh, US Commerce Department and prevented them from getting access uh, to chips uh, from US origin. So that's broadly kind of the, the big picture landscape. I think if you zoom in closer, there's, there's still a lot of uh, interdependencies in the space, as you said. For example, the US itself is dependent on Taiwan um, and Taiwanese firms for the fabrication of the chips. Um, so still, even within this technological domain, where there are kind of more limited players in a more concentrated market, there's still these cross-cutting cleavages. Yeah, it's really interesting to me that like over time with, with semiconductors being such a key like strategic industry, something that has historically gotten so much attention that things like the, the US never actually bothered to like onshore uh, semiconductor tech, or, or not that they never bothered, but that there wasn't the sort of concerted effort that we're now seeing. And likewise, I mean, I guess China had more catching up to do, right? Because these technologies are super, super involved, hard to develop. Like, how's that that Chinese effort to become independent on semiconductors? Yeah, I think the past couple of years have definitely been a wake up call for Chinese policymakers in terms of this being a key weakness of the innovation ecosystem in China. Uh, there's, uh, there's still Chinese firms um, are not really at the technological frontier in terms of chip design, um, semiconductor manufacturing equipment, uh, all the different production um, aspects of semiconductors that I mentioned. Uh, they're definitely putting in efforts to catch up. So uh, there's been a lot of coverage about uh, China investing in large integrated circuits funds. Um, there's also, um, I think what, what's interesting, what's particularly interesting is you've seen in the past that when the technological trajectory itself changes and there's opportunities for new types of chips to emerge, that's when you can kind of disrupt the established players. Um, because if, if the tech trajectory never changes, then the established players just have so many front runner advantages because of the large capital costs of building these plants. Um, the learning by doing gains of being ahead in the previous generation makes you prepared to dominate the next generation. So I've seen and translated writings uh, from Chinese industry analysts saying that if AI chips, so chips specialized um, for different AI operations, um, become 
much hotter and become this new technological trajectory, maybe that's a new space where Chinese firms can compete better. So basically, like you have this whole new new class of hardware hardware requirements to build chips, and all of a sudden it's like everybody's basically starting at square one, and kind of China gets the chance to. That's interesting. You saw you saw this to some extent with Japan in the 1980s with dynamic random access memory chips, and that's shifted too, right? Because like now Japan isn't this this powerhouse anymore in the space. So it is like, do you see that happening with China? Do you, do you see a, a gradual slowing down or? Uh, is the narrative that China seems poised to catch up to and eventually overtake the U.S., for example, is there something to that? Part of it is um, about like what what technology field you're talking about in particular. So with mm. chips, I think it's it would be very hard, um, just in the sense that uh, like there the, the established players in this space um, have built such a moat around yeah. kind of their uh, technological capabilities. Um, so in some of the translations I've done um, that look deeper into this big China government chip fund, um, if you looked at the actual outlays and the actual investments rather than just the announced figures um, of the chip fund, the, the government funding um, that was expensed didn't really even match up to like Samsung's R&D budget, um, just of another like big firm in the space. If you're talking about just general AI leadership or general technological leadership, um, I think it's it's hard to say, it's hard to forecast the future. Different technologies will emerge. A lot of the times we think like everything will be defined by AI, right? It's the next general purpose technology at the heart of this like next production revolution. Uh, but we might forget about older technologies. Like there are still, like we often call AI the new electricity, um, but electricity itself is still improving today. And there's a lot of sort of gains to be done with like, um, like electrification in manufacturing processes. Or even if you look today at like patent data, um, there's a study and research policy by uh, Sergio uh, Petralia, where he looked at like the general purposeness of different technologies and sort of the top 10 uh, from 20, 2000 to 2010 of the top 10 technological classes, like a lot of them were still in electrical um, communications and electricity. Um, so sort of like these older technologies that we never really thought of might become really important. Some of the stuff that we used to think was super, super important and kind of had that same hype cycle as AI, like nanotechnology. It had sort of like the same hype cycle that AI is having now. Um, kind of some of those investments might finally come to fruition decades and decades later. So I think it's it's really, really hard to tell. Um, my personal perspective in terms of this US-China competition for technological leadership is that the US is in a pretty good position right now to have an enduring advantage. And I think it will be hard for China to catch up and overtake the US. And I look at at it more based on the institutions for promoting technology diffusion. Um, mm. So to be able to, I think we oftentimes focus on who generates the novel best practice technique. And we focus less on who's able to spread that to a wide population of users. Um, and I think the mechanisms for public private collaboration in the US are really, really robust and strong. Uh, whereas those are still uh, being developed in China and they're still trying to catch up in that sphere. Yeah, that's something I'd love to talk about more and understand better. So I really have gotten the sense, again, from your newsletter and a couple other places that you're looking here really at a, uh, a tale of two systems. You have you know, an American system with a, a much, obviously much more liberalized, more open uh, kind of competitive market, and then a more centralized, more focused, perhaps um, in different ways, more corrupt, but in, in very specific ways. Like there, there's specific failure modes that the Chinese system has, the US system doesn't, and vice versa. What, like, what are some of the mo most interesting differences there that maybe you know, most people wouldn't have thought of? I'd love to kind of get your perspective on, on that. So maybe one, one entry point uh, that I've been looking at is if you look at uh, the development of technical standards for AI. So these are like engineering protocols and specifications um, for, for like determining maybe like 
what data facial recognition systems um, can collect or how to compare the effectiveness or the accuracy of different facial recognition algorithms against each other. So developing such technical standards um, is really important for firms because if your technology gets embedded into that standard, uh, then kind of maybe like governments, local governments, when they're making purchasing decisions based on these standards, uh, they'll favor your tech. And so it's a way to gain market share and gain reputation for your technology and firm. For governments, it's really important to develop these standards in the sense that it helps with technology diffusion. Like I was saying before, if you have this established uh, benchmark for yeah. judging between different systems, then that technology might spread, not just to the early adopters, like the big tech companies, but to like the small medium enterprises when they're actually, that's where most of the impact of the tech comes. So China's system for developing such technical standards is very much centralized and top down. So the Standardization um, Administration Committee, I believe, SAC, um, they are a key player on this front. And oftentimes the government will try to convene industry and academic players to develop a set of standards. Um, in contrast, the US system is very much bottom up and decentralized, as you mentioned. Um, so um, yes, there are coordinating bodies um, like National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, under Department of Commerce, um, like American National Standards Institute, ANSI. Um, but it's generally driven by industry alliances and private firms themselves in terms of developing such standards for emerging technologies. Now, there are, there are trade-offs to both approaches. So on the one hand, acting in a very centralized top-down manner to impose these standards might help with uptake of some of these technologies and it might provide this sort of like momentum towards standardization. But on the other hand, it might lock in substandard technologies, um, especially when mm. technologies are still in the emerging part of their life cycle. Um, so that gives a little bit of fleshing out a little bit about some of those differences that you mentioned. To dive in a little bit more into the um, sort of incentive structure of the Chinese system. There was a story that you translated, I think in a couple of newsletters ago, uh, that, that explored this kind of this massive scale fraud that happened in uh, semi the semiconductor industry in China, where like a multi-billion dollar company, basically their Theranos, um, the Theranos of like Chinese uh, semiconductors. It'd be interesting to see how that ties into your perception of those failure modes of the Chinese system, you know, is this the kind of thing that does tend to happen as a systemic uh, response to these incentives? Or is this a flash in the pan, like kind of a, a one-off thing? Yeah, I can give the context first and speak to your, your broader yeah, points. Yeah, that'd be great, because I think I butchered that story pretty badly. <laughs> no, it was, you, you got the general uh, brushstrokes right. You're referencing a translation I did of uh, Liao Wang, Outlook Magazine, which is a state-run publication. So it's mostly targeted towards uh, Chinese Communist Party bureaucrats and policymakers. Um, but they do, they do investigative reporting and they've done exposés in the past. Um, so while they're not, um, while they're still beholden to the party, they still have a somewhat uh, quasi-independent voice. So this investigative report um, was looking into this, what they call a tide of unfinished projects, um, six chip projects, um, each on the scale of tens of billions of RMB, um, have been shut down, uh, in succession over the past year. Um, so, uh, this includes firms in, uh, Jiangsu, uh, projects in Hubei, in Guizhou, Shanxi, all across China. Um, so yeah, one example is Nanjing De Kuma, uh, which is a which was like a star company that was often referred to as Nanjing's TSMC. So that's mm -hmm. a reference to the Taiwanese company that I mentioned earlier. Um, but when Outlook Magazine reporter went to the site, um, the factory area was overgrown with weeds. It's facing like 54 labor dispute cases, um, and basically the piece used these six large scale failures as an argument as to how um, this chip making fever and this momentum towards 
um, investing in chips has also led to a lot of reckless investments. Um, now, the broader question as to how expansive this trend is, it, it's, it's hard to say and, and whether the net effect of right. throwing a bunch of stuff and money at the wall and seeing what sticks might eventually be positive. Um, it's hard to evaluate. What I, what I will say though is um, you have to consider the opportunity costs of these reckless investments itself. They're not just wasted money. Um, it's also taking um, valuable employees in a field where technical talent is often starved and a lot of bottlenecks with talent in, in the chip industry. So you're taking employees from other company managers, uh, poaching them for these six failed projects. And now these really talented employees and engineers have wasted two or three years. And even if they went back to their original team, it, the original team would have been working on a completely different type of project and um, they can't keep up with the original team anymore. So uh, I, I would not be too quick to dismiss these kind of big reckless misses as uh, this is just part of um, what effective industrial policy looks like. You're going to have to have some misses um, if you're going to get the big hits out of the park. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a sort of statistical process and, and there's no guarantee of returns on any given, uh, any given project in the, um, the sort of geopolitics, I think of the semiconductors too, like having just established how hard it is to onshore the semiconductor industry through all these failed projects, uh, whether they're top down or not. I mean, this is just a really difficult thing to do. One, one consequence of that, as I understand it, I've seen it argue that this like makes a conflict, an open conflict between uh, China and the West less likely because you have the centralization in Taiwan of like semiconductor manufacturing. The idea is basically that a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, which is kind of the main flashpoint I think most people are concerned about in this context, would be counterproductive or potentially counterproductive because you might not actually end up capturing semiconductor facilities that are useful because people might have left or you know equipment might be damaged and and then you're basically back to square one what's your sense of that and like how much of a how much of a risk would this kind of decoupling be of, of the semiconductor industry does it materially move the needle for you on like us china open warfare risk it's a good question i think it's it it's something to consider. Richard Rosencrantz has a book called The Rise of the Virtuous State. Um, and his argument was um, very similar to uh, the way you outlined um, the reasoning of the people that you're citing. So his argument was that in the past, conquest brought you sort of strategic valuable resources like coal, valuable coal mines on the border of France and Germany. Um, now conquering another state, the benefits of conquests are much more mitigated because capital can flow across borders so much easier and people can leave and move about. And so much of the resources are not contained in the, in the natural, stable, fixed environment, but in this intangible mobile environment. So I think there's some, there's some just rational justification to that. Um, personally, whether like semiconductor capabilities would ever be a meaningful and substantial factor in decision-making about an invasion of Taiwan. Um, for me, I think it's very, very unlikely that that is in like the top 50 of considerations um, for the Chinese government or the US government. Um, of course, I have no inside access to any of the elites actually making those decisions. So I really don't know what basis I have for saying a statement like that, but that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, it's interesting. I guess my, my interest in it reflects probably a commitment to like um, a view that sees AI as more influential on a shorter time scale than maybe most people. So when I think of semiconductors, I really do think like the stuff that powers the computations that will determine the course of human events over the next like decade. But if, if you if you don't see it that way, then I could totally see how it's yeah, it completely changes the calculus. Um, I'm curious as well about like your sense of, of the Chinese population and the Chinese government's perspective on AI itself. Like obviously all countries around the world seem to think AI is really important. But 
what are some of the the ways in which maybe the Chinese government thinks about AI at a very high level strategically that might not be obvious or known more widely in the West? Well, one one funny thing is um, a lot of Western media um, and analysis will say that the Chinese government was the first to establish AI as this national level strategic priority. Um, but then you'll read um, Chinese language articles and commentary that say um, China sees the US as the model in terms of a series of three white papers by the Obama administration in 2016 on developing a national strategy for AI. And they see that the US took the lead in terms of establishing AI as this national strategic technology. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of the discussion surrounds the July 2017 plan, um, which is the AI development plan issued by the uh, state council, which is the cabinet level body of China. I think generally um, beyond just seeing it as a strategic technology, um, there's, I think one driving force, and I think the, the the main driving force, in my opinion, behind why China sees AI as a strategic technology, is because of its possibility to improve productivity and help China escape the middle income trap. And I think mm. it's because economic performance is so essential to the Communist Party's legitimacy and claims to legitimacy. Um, that I think that's what's guiding a lot of their focus on AI. Now, of course, AI has a bunch of other potential implications with respect to um, military power or even um, being used to govern and censor the population um, in a more fine-grained way. Um, so th those are all things that the Chinese government is considering as well. But in my opinion, it's sort of these economic productivity benefits associated with AI that are the driving force. That definitely counters my sort of internal stereotype that like, you know, the, the things that are most easily imagined are usually the ones that our brains reach to. But, um, you know, I, I was thinking like, oh, yeah, Chinese state control, big thing, you know, so that'll be a big reason military. But yeah, the underlying just basic economic argument. Um, I'm really curious about that because this is something that obviously I have no experience with. I think people who don't study China closely will just not know much about this. But like, what is the nature of that trade-off with China where you know, the population kind of accepts, so here's my stereotype of it, and, and <laughs> I'm very, uh, very aware that this is probably wrong in a number of ways, but like the population by and large accepts a certain level of tyranny, a certain level of like um, dogmatism and so on in exchange for steady, reliable growth and the improvements of their prospects year over year. How does that manifest? Like, how, how do you, I guess, how have people come to that perception if it is actually true? It's a good question. I think you captured sort of some of the main characteristics of kind of the social contract. I think it's 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 really hard to make such sweeping statements, and it's it's a little bit yeah, um, it's a little bit out of my wheelhouse in terms of um, kind of exploring that social contract. Um, in more detail, because um, there, so there's there's a lot of other things to consider, um, especially as like you have a growing middle class. Um, so maybe um, it maybe things like environmental um, concerns and ability to deal with air pollution and um, improve uh, life expectancy that might come into calculus more than just uh, growth considerations. But I think I think generally when I talk about performance legitimacy, I think kind of how you outlined it um, makes sense to me. I don't know whether it's really, I don't know whether it's like this fair bargaining agreement between the Chinese yeah. people, um, cause the power is a little bit, right. is very much in balance towards um, the communist party. So um, I wanna make that clear as well, but the broader trends here from when we're zooming out and talking just from a bigger strategic level perspective, um, from the perspective of policymakers, I think they're seeing things like the demographic dividend for China is fading. So that, that source of growth um, is fading. At some point, urbanization will slow down. So, so that source of growth is kind of also reaching uh, diminishing marginal returns. 
So then how do you sustain growth right. um, in the future? Um, and it might come from productivity gains and improving technological innovation and diffusion um, as this n- new source of growth um, that will sustain China into the future. And, and I guess one perspective on on the West too broadly is like as the as our nations become richer and richer, people find themselves with like more time to think about the society that they live in, uh, more self criticism, and so on. And then one way that's manifested in tech is like people really do get critical about perceived invasions of privacy. You know, whether you look at the use of, of AI by Facebook or Google, is there a similar thing as far as you know going on in China, where people as they escape the the lower class, enter the middle and upper classes, even start to look around and say like hey, wait a minute, like, I don't know, for whatever reason, state surveillance might not be the main thing they go for because the values are just different, but certain applications of AI that feel intrusive, like, is, is there pushback against that sort of thing as well in China? Uh, yes, there is this broad pushback that you're describing. So um, think tanks have conducted polls that have shown like, I think like 80% or a very high majority of the general population would prefer not sharing their facial data if another option was allowed. So you have sort of um, this growing blowback against um, increasingly intrusive applications of AI. Um, I can't, I, I haven't seen the breakdown on social demographic terms. So I can't speak to if this is a modernization type effect where um, as people get higher incomes, they become more aware of these issues. Um, I actually think it's, it's a more broad-based phenomenon. Um, yeah. and, and yes, you're right to point out the difference between the two types of privacy where, you, where we are seeing a lot of conversation and robust discussions about privacy in the context of data security and protection against companies misusing or not properly storing your data, um, but not that same level of discussion against government surveillance. Um, and privacy in the sense of a civil liberty or intrinsic right. Do you think that's partly due to a difference in trust where people like trust private companies less, or is it just like the hopelessness of arguing for less government surveillance? It's, it's a, yeah, it's a good point. It's a lot of factors, obviously living in a regime that censors and, you know, actively represses people on these topics is definitely a factor that affects um, whether people are willing to speak out or not. Um, I do think, though, there, there is a role to be played by, um, by this trust um, in the government in the sense that, um, for example, I think Genia Koska has done some really cool cross-national surveys of different um, public's perceptions on facial recognition technology. And I think her team, um, they found that um, Chinese people's perceptions of facial recognition technology uh, they were much more likely to trust the government um, than private companies. Mm. Um, and actually the, the distrust of private companies with respect to privacy protections and managing the data securely was lower in China than um, even in other countries where we might expect more consumer activism about privacy uh, like Germany. Uh, so yeah, I do think there's something to that point you brought up. Another theme that we talk about as well in the podcast a fair bit and have especially in the last like year or so is AI safety and like AI alignment type stuff. This obviously, it's a niche concern in the West. You, you mostly see it, you know, DeepMind, OpenAI, and a couple of academic institutions. But it's becoming more and more important. It's getting more and more attention, especially as we have things like GPT-3 and like Mu Zero coming out. Is there an awareness in China um, I'm guessing not at the government level, because even at the U.S. Uh, in the U.S., we're, we're only just starting to see some of that discussion creeping up at the government level. But are people in the private sector, are people really anywhere in China, talking about AI alignment, AI safety, and, and those sort of re- related clusters of, of concerns? Yeah, I think you you have some um, people talking about it. I don't think there's as robust of a network um, mm. in China as there are as there is in. Um, Western countries. Um, I think partly that's also due to the fact that OpenAI and DeepMind are really unique entities in the sense that like, um, like what could be their Chinese equivalents, like Tencent's AI lab or Baidu's AI lab, Alibaba's AI lab. I think uh, most of their projects are toward maximizing for shareholder projects in the immediate term. 
Whereas you have like these sort of insulated general AI labs and open AI and deep mind, largely free from those uh, concerns. Right. So I think that's part of it. Um, but there are, for example, very strong voices against um, super intelligence. Um, so um, Joe, Joe Zhihua, a professor at Nanjing University, leads one of the top labs in AI. Uh, he has written in articles for like the Chinese Computer Federation that uh, AI researchers should not touch strong AI, that they shouldn't even touch sort of these more transformative AI capabilities and, and not even do research in this type of area. Um, so um, yeah, the Chinese philosopher Zhao Tingyang has also written about concerns about superintelligence. Um, so I think, I think part of it is, um, yeah, maybe even when I say that it's not as robust, the discussions in China, maybe that's partly also because I haven't looked as closely as I should have. And, and there's sort of maybe more to discover on, on all these points that we've been talking about. Well, it's, it's already like an insular discussion, even in the West, right? Like in order to really follow what's going on in alignment research, you kind of have to do it for a while or follow the alignment forum. Like there are all these niche blogs that like most people really don't spend any, even people who listen to this podcast who sort of by interest in alignment broadly are probably not reading this material. So I could really imagine it being like a, a conversation that's happening a little bit in the dark there too. Yeah. And I, I think part of it is also just like, um, maybe we should broaden what we think is AI alignment, right? Like there's this whole body of safety systems research about human machine interactions and how to right. develop machines um, that um, do not create higher risk of accidents and how to develop more reliable kind of machine human teamed systems. Um, that sounds like broadly like alignment. A lot of the insights from that would apply to sort of like the more specific alignment scenarios we talk about when we look at more transformative AI. Um, so I think if you if you broaden your view of what alignment is, maybe there, there's more Chinese discussions about it um, than we think. They're just not framed in the exact way that we've kind of defined alignment. Yeah. yeah, actually, that speaks to one of the themes we've touched on a fair bit in, during the podcast, which is this question of whether in the limit alignment research and capabilities research start to converge because like you've got the, if you've got a super powerful AI system that can do really clever stuff your ability to use it for productive purposes becomes bottlenecked by your ability to kind of like point it and aim it and ultimately align it. So it kind of like becomes a little inseparable. Um, that might be an interesting segue into maybe a, a last point that I wanted to ask you about. So obviously the, the narrative between US and, the US and China on AI is generally framed as one of confrontation, one of c competition. You alluded to um, natural language, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, language translation as being one of those applications that inverts that paradigm and has us think a little bit more in terms of collaboration, cooperation. This is pie in the sky here, but like, I wonder if alignment research would be another area where sort of a bit of trust building could happen. Um, I guess I'm, I'm curious what you think about that. And, and if you think that's not a valid area, which it easily couldn't be, uh, what are some of the areas that you see other than translation where there could be some nice overlap? I think it's a, it's a good point. I think actually, I've translated an article by Fu Ying. Um, she was like a former Chinese ambassador uh, to the UK, I believe, who now also writes on AI and security issues. And, and she, I think she does mention um, things like challenges posed by AI as sort of like these, these common goals that all mm. countries should be working uh, to solve. So yeah, I do think there are these types of like um, global commons type issues that AI engages with um, that the US and China um, will have kind of incentives to continue to work together on. I think like, um, I think the way I often kind of address these questions is to flip it a little bit in the sense that like um, every like kind of the default is cooperation and just continued normal days where like every day there's probably like hundreds of working groups where there's Ch Chinese representatives and US representatives, uh, whether from industry, academia, um, all like working together on issues that cross cut national boundaries and, and address issues like global commons issues. Um, and that's sort of like the default norm. Um, 
and yes, there will be these like exceptional areas where there's sort of like this type of um, heightened co uh, competition and, and conflict. Um, so it's more like identifying the places where there's going to be unavoidable frictions, right? Um, because that's what stands out from the backdrop with the backdrop being um, continued collaboration. Like if you just look at the US and China science and technology relationship, I think it's Richard Suttmeyer who once described it as like the special relationship, like kind of a, a reference to the US and UK in terms of that sort of like the unique density and kind of um, resiliency and robustness of that relationship in a political sense um, could be used to characterize how strong um, the US and China's scientific and technology relationship is in terms of like co-authorship of papers, um, collaboration on research, strategic alliances between different firms. Um, so yeah. that's how I would reframe that a little bit. Well, and it, it's so difficult too, I guess, in, in, the, in the broader sort of, um, in the broader political context, where you do have, like, you you do have things like uh, Falun Gong, organ harvesting, and, and Uyghur Muslim concentration camps, this and that. Like, how do you, um, obviously, these are tough calculations. They're incredibly hard moral calculations to make. And we have to be pragmatic, unfortunately, at a certain point, um, just because of the size of the economy that we're dealing with and the fact that a lot of the technologies that, as you say, we, we are either collaborating or competing on, are very important kind of defining technologies that are going to have a huge, huge impact. And if we don't steward them properly, if we don't adopt the right collaboration kind of atmosphere, the, the, the right shared trust, things can go really badly. But how do you think about like navigating that moral quandary? Do you have any thought? I mean, I know this is like kind of almost an unfairly difficult question because everybody and their grandmother is going to have a hot take on this. I don't think, I don't think there's an easy answer, but do you have any thoughts on, on that aspect? Yeah, it's, it's a tough question. Um, but it's sort of like a question that uh, we definitely need to think through more. So um, maybe one thing would be um, a good kind of example to look at is exactly those types of like research collaborations I was talking about earlier. Um, can we set up more transparent processes to consider uh, the implications, for example, of collaborating with um, Chinese institutions uh, that are involved with human rights abuses in Xinjiang. Mm. Um, so how would you judge um, a particular research project? So if it's, if it's something like natural language processing or facial recognition that seems to have a pretty targeted focus on yeah. the Uyghur population that should raise flags in a review process, uh, either at a university or a firm or any type of body, um, so I think there are ways uh, to do this. It's obviously really, really difficult, but I think it's better than uh, just cutting off ties completely or yeah. going forward with blinders on and not scrutinizing anything at all. Yeah, it's it's always it's a bit of a, a devil's gamble that or devil's gambit where you have to kind of yeah navigate those two really uncomfortable things and it almost feels like nobody wants to bring the two things up at the same time there's the genuine value and criticality of having that relationship especially in the context of really powerful technologies and then on the other hand yeah these genuine human rights abuses that uh, really are are awful and and there's no covering that up so i really appreciate you navigating that uh, here and and dealing with that that especially thorny question um do you have a, a personal website you want to plug have people check out yeah, so I, I usually post most updates and things through the China AI newsletter. Um, so yeah, just if you're subscribed there, you'll usually get um, updates on my latest research or... Awesome. Well, I will say anybody who's listening to the podcast, I mean, I highly recommend the, the China AI newsletter. Um, it's great. So go check it out. If you're interested in the kind of stuff we talked about today or more broadly, uh, some of the more strategic political uh, issues around AI, that's, that's going to be uh, something for you to check out for sure. So Jeff, really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me.